I produced radio for over 20 years. No, maybe 10 years. And um, highlights were in, in West Africa with, uh, when there was only five stations in, in Ghana. I was DJ White Man. And uh, I had a lot of joy playing James Brown and Fela Kuti and Otis Redding for the, for the people in their daily commutes. And in New York, I love to bring in live, live musicians. And here is the festival. Over 30 musicians, this was uh, three weeks ago, over 30 musicians came together and performed for 24 hours straight Indian Raga. And the idea was not mine. It was an, a fellow named Ahmet Ali Arsalan. And the idea made a lot of sense to the musicians because Indian Raga has, is time-specific. Each one has its own vibration, and it's, it, it literally means to color the mind. So here we're going to hear a little introduction of a raga from Kiran Aluwalia. And this is all available. Uh, it was broadcast on the radio, streamed on the internet, and it's available on podcast. So let's see what happens when I press this button. And, and I would say, if you'll indulge me on this, um, our, our brains are really visual. So if you close your eyes, um, that 90% of, of, of your brain that's usually doing um, the visual work will have a deeper experience with the musical work. So here's my friend Kiran Aluwalia. <laughs> So that, that music has its own kind of, of beauty, and, and it comes from specific reasons having to do with ornamentations, um, the rubato delivery, the timeless delivery. But what I'm going to talk about today is where the notes come from in Indian Raga and how that's different from the West and what we've lost and what we can gain from returning that. So. I'll grab this guitar here. Um, when I play a note on the guitar, it vibrates the air at a certain frequency. So that will fly through the sky. Um, vibration of the molecules eventually hit your ear into some liquids, and then the neurons will fire at that same vibration. So let's pretend this is hitting your ear at a hundred vibrations per, per second. Now, as that's happening, at the very same time, it's also, there's a quieter vibration. And that vibration is just double the speed, but it's there. And if you split the, the, the guitar in half, the string exactly in half, you would double the vibration. That's this note. Closely, maybe you can hear that. And that's that, that 
those nodes function so similar, similarly that um, we give them the same note and we give them the same name. So if this was do, then it's do, re, mi, do, 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 do. We call it the octave. It's the same thing. And it just comes from doubling. Uh, doubling the frequency or cutting in half of the uh, string. And who knows about octaves? It's not a human construct. Um, dogs, are who? That's an octave. So, uh, you know, if you ask Scooby Doo where, where the food is, he says, I'm over here. He's, he's, he's doing octaves. Um, what happens if we triple the octave, uh, triple the note in vibration? We get this note. That's our first new note. We can say it's new because I just played an octave and that's the same name. This one has a new name. And once again, if you listen, can you hear that sound? It's there. That note is, is there inside the note. Once the initial note decays. So that's triple, it's our first new note. And it has a kind of feeling of emergence because it's, well, it's the first novel thing. Um, so composers realize this if you think of the movie uh, 2001 with the monkeys um, discovering tools as an obelisk appears, you know. Uh, so that is if we triple a note, we get this new note. We'll call we we'll call it the fifth. This is one, two, three. If we quadruple the note, if we cut this in quarters, we get the original note again. And that has a very interesting thing to do with mathematics. That's, that's to do with prime numbers. Um, any, any note that that's, can be multiplied by two, or divided by two, is just the same note. Because what we said earlier, if you double a note, it's just the same note. So don't, don't worry if you didn't file that so much. But when we get to the third, when we, the triple vibration, we get to the fifth vibration, we get to the seventh vibration, new notes emerge. So let's get to that fifth of vibration. That's our, we call it the major third. If you combine these three notes, you get something. These are the overtones. Like, and you combine, that's, that's what your major chord is. So there's a reason why um, a baby will smile when they hear a major major chord and there's the same reason that you know birds are hip to this they, they know about these overtones and they use them but maybe you notice my, my guitar is tuned to, to western tuning i didn't really nail this major third it's like a little different so let's tune this perfectly Ratio-based music is what all music was um, was was based on until the time of Bach and the well-tempered clavier. And what Western music did is it divided the the octave into equal parts so that a composer could have a piece that goes like this, and then on the same instrument or same piece, he can also do this. If you divided the, the um, scale the way that I'm displaying to you, all the notes are not equally spaced. And it's more perfect, it's, it's more, it's more, um, it gives a different sense. And people who play non-well-tempered uh, instruments would say that Western music is rough. So, 
I came up with a project where I tried to, like the Indian music, create music that is totally based in just intonation. And I collaborated with a, a Bonsuri flute player who has an incredible understanding of this. And he, his name is Joshua Geisler. He can play a, a note on the flute and say, this is 27 over 11, but this is 31 over 6. And we use this then, we use this then. So using his brain, um, we took uh, some guitars on this particular track, just took a guitar and played it with this perfect just intonation tuning, one that's been neglected by the West for a good 400 years. Uh, well, a little less, 200 years. Um, and we, uh, we just, this is just a guitar, maybe just played over itself with some delays and stuff. This is my, what I call the acoustic mandala project. And it's used a lot in yoga, meditation, that kind of thing. You know, you'll hear This is just intonation guitar. So you can see that every type of, of intonation is its own universe. And we know that nothing lights up the brain like music. There's no equivalent. Um, and, and we know that it's been starting to be investigated, its uses in healing. But why do we starve ourselves? Why, why are we only giving our brains one type of music and one that's not not really based on nature, but based on a convention. So, I want to talk about, kind of conclude with a little bit about the powers of music and, and maybe get all these great minds that we have in this room thinking about the new potentials. Because, as I've said, it's, it's magical. I make some of my money DJing it. There's a song we call the, the Song of the Living Dead. It's, because if you're playing a, a function and you put on unchained melody, couples who <laughs> don't even talk to each other, they, they shuffle up as soon as they hear the song. Um, and so, and we, I've seen, I've seen music stop wars. Uh, with that singer, um, Kiran Adewale, I was just in Timbuktu, and there's a festival in the desert. And we were, we were up there, and, and uh, people were trying, you know, I was trying to decide if I should go, because the State Department said it was not a good idea. They said Al-Qaeda was there, there had been some Germans who were kidnapped, uh, you know, that month. And I spoke to some musicians, and they told me, well, just keep your guitar on, and the music will keep you safe. And I know that's a very 
airy idea for Ted, <laughs> you know. Uh, but in my own personal experience, I've seen it happen a million times. And I, I even, at the last night of this festival in the desert where it's the Tuareg people who are nomadic and, and they, they, many people show up on camels and sleep in tents. And there was, there was talk of um, uprising, but nothing happened until after this festival. But at the end of the festival, I, I went out to the Sahara Desert and I started doing some yoga. And I had an insight. I said, I need to get the hell out of here. <laughs> so I went and I, I uh, got my guitar. And I was walking past this guy in a turban. And there were some people with uh, machine guns and people in flatbed trucks. And some kids, probably, he, he had the, he seemed like a warlord type guy. He had a uh, huge turban and there, you know, he had his henchmen around and there were people in flatbed trucks. And some kids were teasing him. I assume that they were paid by someone else. And he was screaming out at the desert. And I ducked into uh, a tent of some friends I had made, and I had only studied their music um, this whole time. Friends from Niger, also, I believe, to our people. And we had tea, and we were playing ourselves acoustic guitars. And I knew he could hear me. And even though I knew he could hear me, I kept playing. And I kept playing because I knew if he ducked in his, his head in the room, in the, in the tent, that he would have to join us. It was that compelling. So as I get the sign to wrap it up, might as well just have a little bit of fun. I brought this gun. And <laughs> it pretty much illustrates um, the power of overtones, a single instrument, uh, nothing else. And as you hear it, I just want you to think about all the capacities of sound healing. Um, for one, a gun can cause a very disruptive experience. So someone wants to make a uh, psychological change, they can go to a gong bath. We do, uh, like my acoustic mandala baths, where you're immersed in sound and you lose track of time. So this will be the gun that says you're all free to go to lunch. And, uh, <laughs> Do me the indulgence of listening to the entire decay of the sound. Here we go. I hope that you all uh, serve music because music is energy and energies have equal and opposite reactions. And if you, the more you take care of the music, the more I'll take care of it. Thank you.